This is Functional Skills English Level 2. Organisational Features, which is subject content number 16. Understand organisational features and use them to locate relevant information in a range of straightforward and complex sources. Let's begin by discussing what are organisational features. So, organisational features are found within a text and they help the reader to find information and they help the writer to present the information. It usually makes the writing a little bit clearer and it helps the reader to be able to follow the text a little bit more. Organisational features include things such as bullet points, headings, titles, numbered lists, paragraphs and columns. Anything that affects the structure or the presentation or the layout of a text, that's organisational features. These are more commonly found in non-fiction texts because stories or fiction texts don't really need them. They use paragraphs in fiction texts, but it's more non-fiction texts that are going to find these kind of things more useful. Essentially, organisational features are used by writers to help break up bigger blocks of text. It makes the text more digestible or easier to read. So. Organisational features relate to how a text is structured. These are a few of the different organisational features that you might come across. So the first is a contents list or a contents page, titles, headings, subheadings, strap lines, bulleted lists, numbered lists, captions for images or photos, tables, columns, text boxes, headers, footnotes, an index page, page numbers, menus, paragraphs, a navigation bar on a website, email headers and a glossary. So there's quite a few organisational features here that you need to try to remember. We are going to go through these, talk about why each of the different organisational features are actually used and how they help the reader and we're also going to look at how you will talk about these in the actual exam. So in the exam, you need to be able to identify the different organisational features that the writer has used. And you also need to be able to explain what the organisational feature actually does. So what is the effect or how does that organisational feature help the reader? Here's an example of how you might write an answer in the exam. The writer has used paragraphs to break up the text and make it easier to read. So here we've got the writer has used paragraphs, that's identifying the organisational feature. And then the second part, to break up the text and make it easier to read, that's the explanation. That tells us why the writer has chosen to use that organisational feature and how it helps the reader to be able to digest the information. So, why does a writer use a contents list? How does this help the reader? Well. They help the reader to find the different chapters or the sections of a text that they want to read. So typically a contents page is going to be at the start of a text and it will outline the different chapters uh, or sections within that text. Using a contents page allows the reader to find the specific pages where they might find information that's relevant or important to them. Next we've got titles, headlines and headings. Now these are actually all completely different things and they are used for different reasons. If you take a look at this picture on the screen right now, what do you think this is? Is Kingsport Police make major drug bust in Riverview? Is that a title, a headline or a heading? If you guess headline, you would be correct. Headlines are used in things like newspapers and magazines. Titles could be used for documents, reports, books, uh, many different texts, um, but headlines are, are specifically for newspapers and magazines. So essentially a title is used by the writer to tell the reader what the text is about. A headline differs because although it does tell the reader what the text is about, it also tries to grab the reader's attention. 
So a writer will make a headline catchy, snappy um, and interesting to try and draw the reader in and make them want to continue reading the rest of the text. A heading, on the other hand, is typically used in a long text and it's a short phrase that describes what a next section is about. It's not the same as a title and it's not the same as a subheading. Um, if you think about chapter headings as a heading, that's what that means. So a title is for the whole document and a heading would be a part of that document. A headline is for a newspaper or a magazine. So what do subheadings do? Well, subheadings help break down a document into much smaller chunks. They tell the reader what the next section of a text is about and they also help the reader to be able to locate information within the text. So if they're looking for something specific, if you've got a document about food safety and you want to know specifically about food poisoning, you will might skim and scan through the text looking for the specific word food poisoning, if that's a subheading, and then you'll know that that's what that section of the text is going to be about. Next we've got strap lines. So strap lines, again, these are used in um, newspapers, magazines, advertisements, things like that. Um, the couple of examples there might be familiar to you. So we've got Nike, Just Do It, and McDonald's, I'm loving it. So strap lines, you might have heard the word slogan before, um, but strap lines are a written form of a slogan, essentially. So they sum up what the company is about or the brand. Um, they're usually really short and memorable. And the writer uses these to help the reader remember the company or the product or the text. So they have to be short and snappy and really, really memorable. Next, we've got paragraphs and columns. So first, if we think about paragraphs, why does a writer use paragraphs? Well, basically, they break up the text. If you've ever tried to read a text that doesn't contain paragraphs, it's really, really difficult. So writers use paragraphs to separate information and quite simply, they make the text easier to read. Columns, on the other hand, they're the vertical blocks of text. And you're going to find these in places like newspaper articles and maybe magazine articles as well. And these also make the text easier to read. But they also make it quicker to read as well. So by using columns, your eyes don't have to travel as far across the page or the screen. And in turn, this helps the reader to consume more information at a quicker pace. In the past, newspapers came on massive pieces of paper, the broadsheet papers. If they had the writing going all the way across the page, it would be it'd be ridiculous. Your eyes would have to travel so far from, to get from the start to the end. So by putting the information in columns, it helps your eyes to travel a lot quicker and you're able to consume that information in a more reasonable way. The method just kind of stuck around because it works. It also makes it a little bit more attractive. So when you've got text in columns, it kind of makes a reader feel like there's not as much there. So they might be more likely to read it as well. But the main reason is it makes it easier and quicker to read. Next, we've got two different things. So we've got a bullet point list at the top and we've also got a numbered list. So what's the difference here between a bullet list and a numbered list? Well, bullet points are typically used to separate information into short bits so that it's easy to read. The important thing here is usually there isn't any kind of set order. So it could be a random summary or summation of information um, or things like top tips or key features. You might put things like that into bullet points, whereas a numbered list is used instead of bullet points for things that are in a set order, such as instructions or when there's some kind of a priority order that things need to be followed in. So the writer uses numbered lists to help the reader know which order to follow the process or instructions. So bullet points and numbered lists in writing are often used for slightly different reasons. 
Always be careful with this, check which one has been used. It might use numbers or it might use a lettered list as well, so A, B, C, D, E instead of numbered. So you've got bullet points, numbered list or a lettered list as well. Next we've got tables. So tables really help the reader to understand potentially complicated data. So they allow the writer to organise information in a clear and easy to read way by using rows and columns to present the information or the data. So this might be numerical data like in this example, but it could be words as well. If you think about how this information has been presented here in this example, if this was written into sentences, it would be pages and pages of information. So by putting it into a table, we can really quickly see concentration 9% in trial number five. We can see that straight away that's 52.96 and we don't have to read lots of information to find that data. It takes seconds. So the writer will use a table to present potentially complicated information or data in a clear and easy to read way. Moving on, we've got captions for images. Now it's important to point out here the image itself is not an organizational feature. It's only the caption that's classed as an organizational feature. So the caption is the sentence or phrase below the picture or the photograph that tells the reader what the picture is actually about. So it just provides the reader with a little bit of extra information so they know what they're looking at. In this example, we've got the caption, the Great Pyramid of Giza completed 2560 BCE. So it tells us what that picture is that we're looking at. Um, and it's important to not mix up captions with headlines or subheadings. Um, they're very different things, remember. So headlines is kind of like a title, but for a newspaper or magazine, and a subheading tells you what like a paragraph or a section of a text is about. Next, we've got text boxes. So text boxes are commonly used in texts where the writer wants to highlight important or key information that they haven't put into the main body of the text. So this might be something like key features or contact details or really any kind of information that they want to make it stand out and catch the reader's attention. A footnote is that small text that you find right at the bottom of a text. So usually they are at the bottom of the page and they are indicated through the use of uh, sub or superscript numbers or perhaps an asterisk, the little star symbol. And what they do is they provide additional information. So that could be a source or a definition um, but writers do use footnotes for several different purposes. This could be a citation, so telling you where the reader, uh, sorry, where the writer has found that information. Just a bit of additional information about something. Um, copyright permission, so are they actually allowed to share this information? A bit of background information. It could be definitions. So there's lots of different reasons why a writer might use a footnote. In the exam, if you get a footnote, you should probably read the text quite carefully and read the footnote to work out which reason they've used it for. I'd probably say sources and definitions are the most common that you might come across. So in this example, this is talking about Microsoft Word. So if it says save time in Word with new buttons that show up where you need them. And then we've got the little number one next to Word, meaning Microsoft Word. And then down at the bottom, you've got a footnote. So that little number one might explain what Microsoft Word is. So it's a digital software used to create documents digitally or something. You know, so it provides a little bit of information about that thing that it's uh, got the number next to. Next, we've got email headers. So it's quite common for emails to come up in the exam. Um, and it might be, you know, if you've got something like an email, there might not be that many organizational features. You know, it's not gonna have headlines and titles. It might have subheadings, but it also just as equally might not. Um, but an email should always have this, the email headers. So the email header is the area where you put the information. So you've got who it's to, 
who it's from, what the subject of the email is, if it's been copied to anybody, it also might include the date in there as well. So a straightforward answer for this would be the writer has used email headers to tell the reader who the email is to, who it's from and what the subject of the email is. Next, we've got the index. So the index is usually found at the very end of the text or the back of a book. And what the index does is it tells the reader page numbers of the topics. So it helps the reader to locate specific information. Now, this is different to a contents list. So if you remember, the contents list tells the reader the different chapters and the page numbers of those chapters. The index is more specific. So for example, if you have a recipe book and it's like a baking book, for example, and you've got lots of different recipes in there, but you specifically want to make something with chocolate, you would look down, it's almost like a dictionary, so everything's in alphabetical order. You'd look through A, B, C, and then you'd look through find chocolate, and then it should give you a list of the different chocolate recipes and the page numbers where you can find those chocolate recipes. In the actual book, the chapters might be starters, mains, and desserts. So it's more specific. Okay, so we've looked at some of the main organisational features that you should try to remember for the exam. So now let's have a bit of a practice. I recommend you keep this table somewhere. You know, you could take a picture of it or screenshot it, whatever you need to do. But this table basically summarises the different organisational features and also what they do. So in the exam, you could write something along the lines of the writer has used subheadings to tell the reader what they need to know or to tell the reader what the next section of the text will be about. So you can use this table to really help you with your answers. Obviously, you won't do it word for word, but you can take from it and add bits and take bits away. Okay, let's have a bit of a practice then. So on the next slide, I'm going to make this text bigger so that you can actually see it. Um, but I want you to have a go at doing two different tasks. So the first is identify two organisational features in this text. And then the second question is, what information do these organisational features help the reader to find? So remember, when it says, what do they help the reader to find? That's what do they do? Why have they used that organisational feature? So looking at this text, what organisational features can we find? So at the top, we've got subheadings. So we've got quite a few subheadings here, um, identifying the different parts of this text. We've also got plenty of paragraphs to help break it all down. Down at the bottom here, we've got a footnote and that links to this bit here and it's shown with the, the two asterisks. We've got a bullet point list on this side. We've got a table and we've also got page numbers down at the bottom. So why have these organisational features been used? Subheadings have been used to tell the reader what the section of the text is about. So there are one, two, three, four, five, five different subheadings on page seven. And each one of those subheadings tells the reader what the next paragraph or the next section of the text is about. Sometimes it is just one paragraph as it is um, for, th for four of these uh, subheadings, but the first one is for two paragraphs. Paragraphs have of course been used to break up the text so it's easier for the reader to actually read and digest the information. A footnote has been provided to give some additional information to the reader. So in this case, the footnote has been added to the word most fractures. And then down at the bottom it says specified injuries for further information see www.hse.gov.uk so it's providing the reader with additional information it's providing them with information on where they can find out more about this particular topic the bullet point list has been used to summarize some key information 
the table here, it contains lots and lots of information, but putting it in a table presents the information in a much easier to read format. And finally, we've got the page numbers. So the page numbers help the reader to locate information when using the contents list or the index at the, at the end or the back of the book. And so if, if there's page numbers, they know where to actually find the information. Okay, so let's have a look at what this would look like with an actual exam question. So the exam question here is identify two organisational features used by the writer in text B. What information does one of these features help the reader to find? So this question is worth a total of three marks and it can be broken down into two different sections. The first part is asking you to identify two organisational features and that's worth two marks. Then it's asking you to explain what information one of these features helps the reader to find. So here you're saying literally, what does it do? Why has the writer used this organisational feature? To get the full three marks, you must give two organisational features and one explanation. So here's an example. The writer uses paragraphs and subheadings in text B. That's the first part of this question, identify two organisational features used by the writer, that would get you two marks. And then explaining it, subheadings help the reader to identify what the next section of the text will be about. So that would be the final, the third mark, and that's saying why the writer's used it and in what way it actually helps the reader to navigate the text. You don't have to, if it's worded in this way, you don't have to explain both of the organisational features because it's only asked you for one. What information does one of these features help the reader to find? So always make make sure that you read the question really carefully so that you're only giving the information that you need to give and not over answering the question. That's it for this video. I'd like to wish you the best of luck with your exam and thank you ever so much for watching. Goodbye.